Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our new BCN analytics session. Today, we are here to talk about measurement and marketing effectiveness. Uh, in my case, this has been the topic in the last five, six years. But when talking to other people, either marketeers, people working in e-commerce departments, data scientists, this is really also the topic for them. Because at the end, we are talking about, hey, can, how can I assess the efficiency of the money I'm spending on TV, for instance? Or how can I test the true incrementality of a display campaign? So these are like conversations that everyone is having. And today, we are trying to address this topic, which, to be honest, has been the topic for a while. So uh, that is the quote, uh, an old one, which I, I really like it. I remember that one. So maybe for the younger people, it's not that uh, well known. But basically, it's have the money you spend on advertising. It's wasted money. Travel is, I don't know, which 50%. And that was the mindset for a while. Reality is that now we are in a much better position. Because thanks to the arrival of digital economy, we have platforms, uh, tools, analytics, data scientists. And now we are in a much better position to fully understand or at least to understand better the true incrementality of every euro we spend on advertising. And that's why we organize this session. And that's why we are bringing three fantastic spe speakers from Google, Ipsos, and Neo Gilby. I will present them later on. But before getting into the content of the session, let me do a quick housekeeping on BCN Analytics. First thing, as I said before, this session is being recorded again. And that's thanks to Shifted. They are sponsoring these sessions. So uh, it's really great they are doing this, because then people can enjoy the content later on. So thanks, team, and thank the Shifted team to, for making this possible. Second thing, last time we all met here, you may remember, we said we are organizing a hackathon with Social Point. I was even chasing people to register, say, come on, register now. So we did that. The hackathon happened, and we are really happy about the outcome. So I think it would be good to share with you the main insights of the hackathon. So I'm asking two people to come on stage just to share the pressure. Those two guys are Sharon Bigger, head of analytics at Social Pwn, and Mauricio Rodriguez, one of the co-founders of Vision Analytics. So big applause for them. All right, so I get to the talking today. Um, I'm only going to take a couple of minutes of your time to give you a little summary of the event. So first of all, a big thank you to Social Point, Sharon's team. They were fantastic, not just in helping us with the funds to make it happen and the logistics, but also they were fantastic during the day. They brought a lot of energy, and it was a, a great, great event. So what was it like? Um, it was 10 different teams with 40 participants, and it lasted for 24 hours. That meant that it started on a Saturday morning, and it ended on the Sunday the next morning. Um, and it was 24 hours open, so people would submit uh, throughout the, the whole time, and they could, you could see the live results of the different teams as the time was going. So once we closed the, the okay, so we took it, we took, it took part of the um, social point offices, and we were there most of the day, but at night we had to close doors, and people continued working 24 hours, so that was fantastic. We saw a lot of uh, engagement from everyone. They really wanted the prize, which was also quite nice, uh, 17,000 euros. Um, and a lot of food, yes, a lot of food. <laughs> um, so what was the challenge? The challenge was to build a churn predictor, which basically means that out of real data of the downloads of Dragon City, which is a game of social point, uh, you had to predict how many of those users were going to churn and not, not use the game anymore. And we were giving out three different prices, two of them for the best models, which were, of course, tested against real data. And then the third one for business insights, which meant that the teams had to build a presentation. So it was actually a pretty cool challenge, because not only did they have to build the actual statistical models and all the math behind it, but they also had to work in somehow some slides and extract some, some business insights to be able to present to a panel of experts that we put together. Um, and out of that, we had the winners. Um, I think some of them are here. I think I saw some familiar faces. Uh, but we had three different teams winning all the different prizes, which was great, again, because theoretically, one team could have won prediction and insights, but that was not the case. So it was pretty well spread out. Congratulations to everyone. And finally, last but not least, I would just like to add one thing. Um, this type of events are great. I mean, they take a lot, a lot of effort, I can tell you, because we spend a lot of hours putting this together. But they're very, very good to put together a community. And I do want to make emphasis on this, because 
it is important that we come together as a group to get value out of ourselves. Uh, the market out there, it, it, we, we, we live in an international market which is very tough, it's a very crowded market and there's a lot of competition. And the best way in which we're gonna stand out is as a team. So this is a great type of event to make connections, also get to see what other people are doing, what are the best practices, what technology are they using, and just have a little bit of fun. So we hope to put together another one this year, um, not putting a date against it, but uh, we hope to do it and we hope to see a lot of you there. All right, thank you. Okay, so it's exciting to have another one. You said September, right? I heard you, no? you commit. So uh, just a couple of things before starting the session. So for those of you tweeting, the hashtag is gonna be BCN measure. And also, uh, we are really pushing Periscope. Anyone using Periscope here? That's one person, great. So we are really happy if anyone can do a streaming on Periscope. I'm, you know, Gerard PK is using a lot of Periscope, and this is our benchmark. Anyway, so feel free to tweet on Periscope uh, today's session. So the agenda for today, just uh, as a reminder, we have three speakers. Bosco Anguren, Head of Media Buying Solutions at Google, Spain, and Portugal. Eva Lopez, uh, Client Service Director at Ipsos, uh, Connect Barcelona, and René Deschamps, Data Science and Analytics Director at Neo Gilby. So we have like around 50, 55 minutes for them to present. Then we have time for questions. I will raise a couple of questions and then we will open for you guys to raise your questions and create some debate. Again, I think this topic is so exciting and still there are so many things to improve that don't feel overwhelmed. I mean, no one is completely right at this point. I think it's good to have a conversation around the topic. After the questions, we'll have time for networking and beers. I know some people just came from the beers, so the beers will be there, but you have to wait a little bit. And at the end, if some people want to stay longer, as we did last time, we are going to go to this nice Irish pub. Just put them up here. It's a five minute walk from here. It's in Urquinaona. So for those of you who want to stay longer and keep chatting and uh, networking, uh, we are happy to, to do that. So. Big thanks also to Mobile World Center to share, for sharing with us this fantastic venue. Also, Australia Down for the beers. And then I was told by Adriana that our friends of Data Beers are organizing next session, May 31st. 31st. So I also think it's great that they are doing this sort of event. So Data Beers, May 31st, uh, feel free to join. I think we will be there and we'll have fun and beers. Good, so uh, with no further delay, let me now present the, uh, the first speaker. First speaker is uh, Bosco Aranguren. I think uh, anyone working in the digital, in the marketing, in the programmatic knows Bosco, or should know Bosco, if you don't know him, he's a really nice guy. So he's uh, currently the head of media buying solutions at uh, Google Spain and Portugal. He has over 15 years of working experience in marketing, digital, programmatic, working for companies such as L'Oreal, Lancome, Pooch. Has also a degree at Universidad Complutense de Madrid on business and science. So give a warm welcome to Bosco. So yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, all yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I love how, how you pronounce my surname in English, Aaron Guren, Aaron Guren. <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Uh, so hello, everyone. It's great to have you to be here with you. Uh, actually, uh, well, while we were preparing this, this uh, session together with, with Manuel, I was trying to get, you, uh, get uh, a little bit more of you, no? who you are, what you were interested in. And, and I must say that uh, it seems that you are a pretty eclectic group. No? Because when I was checking with my I said, do you think this, this issue or this item will be interesting for them? I said, sure, sure, sure. And what about this one? Yeah, of course. And this one, yes. So I don't know if he was fooling me or if he really have interest, high interest in everything. So basically what I pulled out uh, with this kind of brief, an eclectic brief, is what I thought that it would be more relevant for the vast majority of you. Okay? So let's start. I love this quote from, from the, him. He was the, the CEO of GA for 20 years. 
And basically, he defined very well what's competitive advantage. It relied in two main uh, pillars. One, the ability to know about your consumer better than, uh, faster than your competition. But on the other side, the ability to, act, to, act, to actually activate that knowledge faster than your competition. So if you think about it, it's pretty much the same of what we intended to do today. And the two pillars, if you read carefully, we're talking about two things nowadays, which is data and technology. That hasn't changed. What has changed is the amount of data that we have, the increasing need to actually focus that data in one single point so we can actually have a better view of our consumer, and also how technology can help us activate all that knowledge. So from a double click Google, what we intend to do is basically this, is how to use these two levers, so data and technology with a single purpose, which is basically have one-on-one -on -one conversations with our consumer in a massive and scalable way. Okay? So how we actually get the data merged with technology and be a programmatic buy-in, we can actually activate that data for something that makes sense. Okay? So no wonder why uh, companies are investing in data and technology. So it's not you know, uh, something that comes by chance that the top, uh, the 25 percent of, of top 100, 500 uh, Fortune companies have recruited a chief data officer last year. Which, to be honest, it was not very common uh, to find this kind of profiles uh, two years ago. So companies are paying uh, close attention to, data, to data, and actually they are building their internal capabilities and bringing in people who actually can help them solve this issue. On the other side, what they need is the right technology to actually have a proper common ground to use that, that data. Because let's be honest, uh, data is not something that has come in the, in the last two years. Data is something that companies have had forever. They lay and they sit uh, in, in tons of data. The problem is that this data generally is structured in silos, so the data does not speak to data, and there's no way to activate it. Okay, we'll talk about that. So, uh, when it comes to to challenges in the organization, I have selected these four topics. The first one is about the technical infrastructure. Okay, so what I mentioned: if the data is in silos, we need to break down those silos. So data starts talking, okay? This is, and, and normally this is what we find in, in most of the companies. Uh, technology decisions were made isolated. That means that every single department thought and made a decision of, on technology, not taking a look into the wider picture. Because they didn't foresee that actually that data needed to talk at the end of the day with that other data, okay? Then it comes to another problem that we are seeing is, okay, now that I have the technical infrastructure, who is going to manage this? Is it going to be in-house? Is it going to be outsourced? We don't know. We see different trends in that sense. Once we have the data and actually the profiles to use, uh, well, sorry, technology and, the, and profiles to use the technology is actually how can I pass from, let's say, a uh, uh, big data scenario to a smart data scenario. How can I get that data that's really relevant for my business? Okay, and the last one is how can I activate all this data? Fine? Let's go with the first one. So, I like to think about what are your, your technical and your, and your infrastructure needs in, in a framework that actually is based on three main buckets, okay? Think about where data lays in the deal space within your companies or your clients' companies. So, so we can find three different buckets. The first one is related to media. I want to know exactly where I have impact 
uh, that user how many times, not only in one device, but also if I can have that cross-device de cross uh, view, that would be helpful for me. Okay, so I have all that data, all that media-centric uh, data. Once I have that information, what I also want to know is actually what has happened in my, in my website, right? So not only the uh, media-centric data, but the site-centric data. And if I combine both, I have a better vision than just one isolated from the other. So what's the third bucket that's missing? It's basically what is related to my consumer, my CRM. If I'm able to connect all those dots, I can start doing very interesting things, apart from having one single view of my, uh, of my consumer. But I can do more advanced, and I can do more sophisticated stuff. Like, for example, media buying according to lifetime value of my, cons uh, of my customer, which is something that's definitely interesting. And that part has to do with the activation via media. But not only media, you can also activate in terms of customer experience and messages. Why should I tell this customer that I know who he is the same story that I told this one? Wouldn't it be interesting to actually be able to do in real time and have conversations in real time depending on what interactions he has had or she has had with my brands and products? So the other, uh, the, other the second uh, challenge that we found that I was mentioning is OK, now that I have the infrastructure, now that I have uh, the technical needs sorted out, what kind of profiles do I need? And the profiles I need are very different and are currently are very demanding, right? So I need actually someone that knows about my business, that knows about media, and has super strong analytical capabilities. Sorry. And, and it's something that even uh, within, within the company I work for, uh, we have this kind of issue. So these profiles are becoming increasingly difficult to find. And basically, we call them the unicorns of the world, no? Because they are very scarce uh, and very valuable. This is, this is real. This is the kind of skills that actually we're looking for uh, in terms of profile. And you will see that it's someone that actually is able to navigate through all that uh, jungle of data to get what's relevant for me activated. And not only that, but also is able to actually make a difference in my business and share with the rest of my business what he's able to do. OK? So different skill sets, whether they're uh, internal or external, we don't know. Up to you to decide. And the third one, the third challenge, was exactly creating these customer-centric insights, no? So actually uh, having that visibility of every single touch point. And by the way, not only digital, but also I would like to know what's going on, on in the offline world, no? In terms of media, but also in terms of impact. What has uh, happened at my shops? What happened, I don't know, at my call center? And have all that together so I can have that single view of that single customer. OK? DMPs. DMPs, think about them like a big aggregator of data. DMPs is becoming a very hot topic. And actually, uh, according to eMarketer, I think 91% of marketers would like to know more about DMPs in 2016. We do have a DMP. Uh, and, and it's quite funny because DMP is becoming like the hype world in the, where in, the, in the industry. But whenever you go to a marketer and you try to find out why, why do you need a DMP, in many cases, really they don't know. It's unclear for them what are the use cases. It's unclear for them how much effort they actually need to do before they start putting out data. And for what purpose? Is it really incremental to what they have? OK? Just those kind of things is what we are encountered today. And what about activation? That was the fourth challenge. Uh, activation, we tend to think about activation mainly on the, on the marketing side. But it has a lot of other applications. We see how data is influencing product. 
we have seen for a number of years, for example, in the automotive industry, how the car configurator actually played a super important role on what was uh, what they were demanding to the to the central in terms of product. I want this car in this color with this uh, configuration because they knew that was what they were going to be demanded in four, in four months' time, which is the average purchase time of a, of a car. Okay? So it is clear that data can be activated not only marketing, but product, operations, uh, or even customer care, the way we interact with our customers. There are, uh, how am I doing in terms of time? Four more minutes. Four more minutes, okay. So uh, I also wanted to bring some, some more tangible stuff, no? Things that we are already doing with some of our consumers, or, or I would say also research that we run with, with BCG, Boston Consulting Group, uh, for example. So uh, for the sake of time, uh, I will, I'm going to skip the, the BCG one, that I can sell the full details uh, if you want to learn about that. But basically what it says is that operating with technology and integrated technology, which is also important, uh, actually improves efficiency up to 32%. But when we come to uh, uses, business uses of what we have done, I wanted to share with you three, three cases. The first one is Tok Tok. Do you know Tok Tok? No? Okay, so, so it's an uh, operator in the, in, the, um, in the UK that has mobile and fixed lines. And basically what they have done is by using our technology, bring the CRM data to GAP, now GA360, sorry, and how, with that integrating view. GAP stands for Google Analytics. Google yeah. Analytics Premium, yeah? Yeah, so okay. maybe some people do not okay, know. Okay, okay, yeah. sorry, sorry for that. And activate it. Uh, so they actually start doing media buying, but not based on social demographics, but based on business. So I have my customer, I know who they are. I put it in a place that actually I'm able from there to activate it. So I start uh, by media in terms of what makes sense for my business. And whenever we see that kind of, the, uh, of dynamics, the results are simply amazing. It makes a lot of sense, a lot of sense, okay? Uh, L'Oreal is another brand that uh, has been very active in the, in the programmatic space. Uh, this is a case with Shuemura. Do you know Shuemura? Is one of the brands? No one? <laughs> okay, so, so it's, it's a niche brand, okay? And, and as a niche brand, you would guess that they have difficulties. The difficulties in this case is that they have limited budget. And on top of that, they had limited, uh, I would say, number of stores, okay? So in this case, the thought behind was, what if, what if, I use data not to reach everyone like a CPG company does, but to reach those that I think that are more relevant for my business. And once I reach those, I start to learn from them. So I can be more precise actually running the, the, the funnel with them. So from, I would say, upper funnel study down to lower funnel, the waste should be minimal. And basically, that's what they did. But on, not only that, but they asked the technology to actually find more profiles of those that converted and had a high value for them to the technology. Hey, I want more of this, okay, as well. The results, you have them on screen and are quite phenomenal. And the last but not least uh, is uh, Peugeot. You know Peugeot? <laughs> okay, so, so Peugeot, in this case, Basically, what they wanted to do is they wanted to uh, start thinking more in terms of precision marketing, no? So knowing my consumers, how I'm, I'm able to actually interact with them on a conversational mode so I can change the messages according to that audience. Let me explain. Imagine you do a 308, uh, 308 configuration, red. Uh, diesel, I don't know, full spec, okay, for the price of uh, 15,500. What it makes sense is that the next interaction that uh, you have with the brand 
is related to that information that we already have. And maybe we want to show you the 308 red uh, full equipped uh, uh, and well, or with a price of 300 per month. I don't know. Okay. By doing that, they were able to actually uh, decrease the cost per lead on a six month basis by 15% every, every month, which is phenomenal achievement. But on top of that, what they realized is because they use creative dynamics, uh, sorry, dynamic creatives, which is basically just one creative that changes assets based on who you are, that the reduction in cost of production went down by 98%, 98%. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that we're starting to do with uh, data, and I hope you find them interesting <laughs> and fascinating, and as I do find them. And if you want to have any questions uh, at the Q and A session now, yep. we'll come. So thanks a lot for your <laughs> attention. Uh, Okay, so next speaker is going to be Eva. I first met Eva one year ago in the ICOM, where she was telling a very, I think, interesting presentation. I showed that presentation again six months after with some uh, enhancements. So I think it's great what, uh, what Ipsos is doing. And I'm really happy they are presenting this today. Uh, so Eva has over 25 years of experience in the research field, combining like research and analytics skills. So it's also one of those profiles really looking forward for innovations and new methodologies on how to assess uh, uh, advertising, creatives, and impact. So big welcome to Eva. All yours. Hi, hello, good afternoon. Um, well, what I'm going to tell you is a story, uh, a case that we lived uh, like two years ago, something like this. Um, we want just to explain you what happened and why we did the things in the way that we did. And we think that it's really interesting because it gives us a new view of how things can be done. So just, just to explain you, uh, one day, one very big company came to us and tell us that they would like to, to do a test. We are, you know, we are experts in testing communication, etc. So they want to test, uh, to do a test of communication, but they want to have a very concrete things, which it was, I want to test uh, how different are different ads behaving if you are only on TV or if you are exposing the people both on TV and digital, which is something that everyone has the question, we are analyzing it, but how to do it? So we know that, okay, we can cookie things on, on the digital and that's great, but what to do with TV? Why? Because we also need to do this in a very controlled way, so we really need to be sure that everyone was exposed exactly to the same environment, that there is nothing that was biasing the results, etc. So we, it was a, a kind of challenge because we also needed to be sure that it was the same person. So we cannot take data for, from the digital platform and then data from the TV platform. We need them to be exactly the same person. And we need to be sure that they were exposed exactly to the same number of times to the ad. So uh, we need to have a very accurate way of knowing that people was exposed to the ads in order to isolate this additional factor of the results that we want to see. Whoops. It doesn't want to change. <laughs> Okay, so the thing is that we need to have exactly the same methodology. So we, didn't, we cannot mix up different methodologies, which is the standard that has been done till that moment. So, wow, 
this is a very good challenge, very uh, fun, but not that fun because we have to go to our office and think about how to put this in place. So what we did, let's say that we mixed the 20th century with the 21st century. So we have the digital and all the new things, but we knew how to do things in the, last, uh, in the past. So we test ads on TV, for TV, so we knew how to do this. So what we did was to create a lab test. A lab test environment when we were able to have everything under control. We knew exactly what people have been uh, exposed to. Uh, we knew exactly how many times people were, ex were exposed to the ads, everything. So how we did it? We, as I tell you, we take this from the 20th century. Uh, we, we, we tested the ads, just sending to the people houses a DVD with a TV program, with a clutter reel, uh, with all the TV ads, just the same as you can see at home, but just controlled. And this is the thing that, the way that we tested the TV. And then the question was, how to test things in a digital thing, in a di digital environment. So what we did was just to create a simulation of the YouTube. Hope it works. Okay, so the thing is that we recreate this YouTube application that works both for desktop, mobile, and it was Okay, and it was replicating exactly all the features, so people can uh, select the content they wanted to see, then the pre-roll appears, they can skip the ad, they can uh, see the ad till the moment they want, they can look at in landscape, in vertical, everything. So all respondents uh, had the opportunity to replicate their real life, what they will do in their real environment, but it was controlled, and it was controlled everything. So the content they watch, the content they select, the ad that was served to them, everything was under control. So we knew exactly what they were doing, and we have exactly the same information when they were exposed to DB. So at the end, this challenge of having people controlled uh, without cookies, we were able to succeed with it. Then all the respondents were invited to participate in um, I'm afraid this is a kind of circle. Okay. So we had all this information. We were able to replicate everything. And then what happens? So we have this uh, covered these two priorities. The first one is to reflect the reality. So we knew that it was a lab, but we need to be the, as close as possible to the reality. And also, we, we wanted to reflect the viewing moment. So if people would like to skip the ad, they could skip the ad. If people were like chatting with their friend because they like or not the TV program, they, they were able to do this. So it's like kind of reflecting exactly what will be the reality. And uh, what we did, so we did, we developed this lab environment and we did globally. One of the elements of the key points was that we can do this at any country you can think about. The only difference is that in some countries we were able to do this, let's say online, the whole survey, and in other countries we did it face to face because there are not enough online panels to cover it. But the way that we were gathering the information in all the countries was exactly the same. So that gave us the opportunity to put all the information together. So we did um, 5,200 interviews in seven countries. And the results of this uh, lab test was in, first case, in the first step something that we all knew, but it was just the confirmation that if you are exposed to uh, an ad within a TV program, the brand will grow. So brand awareness, ad awareness, and purchase intention are benefiting for being exposed in a TV program. This is something that we expected and we confirmed. And for us, the nice thing or the really strong thing is that 
if you combined one OTEs in TV plus one OTEs in YouTube, the uplift for your brand is even better. So TV alone is good, but if you combine YouTube plus TV, it is even better. So your brand is benefiting, is getting a much higher increase both in ad awareness, which is the most sensible one, but also in purchase intention and in, uh, in ad awareness as well. So these are the results. And then this is what has already been published and everyone can have access to this. And now we are going just to explain very few things that we, let's say, in the back office were thinking about. And we tried just to give uh, some, some light on this. So why this is happening? Actually, we always say that uh, for the communication to work, you need to engage them and, and to take them, uh, pick them uh, their attention. And actually, all the, all the viewers are having the same attention. So because they select to see a TV program or they select to see uh, a YouTube content. So from this point of view, it's the same. You are engaging with the content and you select the content you want to see. But maybe the main difference is the moment and the immediacy of when the advertising appears. In TV, it tends to be when you are, you are really relaxed and it has happened you know, a while and then TV appear, uh, ad appears. While in YouTube, before the content appears, you have to watch it. So maybe this is something that is helping to, to make, uh, let's say, to, to work better the combination of both TV plus TV. Okay, so this, this is something that we don't have to prove, but what we do know is that if we are just isolating the data of the YouTube ads, five seconds are enough to move the funnel. So uh, we, we saw that people that skip the ads, so they, when they have the opportunity to say skip, they skipped it. We are gathering uh, some uplifts on the advertising awareness node. So people, they are aware that have seen an ad of the brand and they remember it in top of mind. So the first thing that I ask him, have you seen an ad of this category? And they mentioned your brand. So this is enough. And this, is, I think, is very interesting as well. Obviously, the creative are thought to be watched entirely. So if you want them to work better, it's, better, it, it, it's, it's something that and needs to be there, the uh, thing. So the more the people watch the ad, the better are the results. So here it's always the challenge for the advertisers and the, to the advertising uh, agencies to create some ads that keep people engaged in the end because then you will get have the most of it. As said, we have also seen how it is increasing step by step. So each additional second is providing better results for your brand funnel. But also, it's important to think, and this is something that we need to uh, have more, more cases behind, but uh, we have found that it works better, it works with uh, desktop. So you, you can see uplifts when you are uh, exposing people to a desktop but it works even better if they are watching your ad in a YouTube environment in a mobile. So five seconds are good, but if they're in a mobile, they're e even better than in a, in a desktop. And how can we just bring this information and go back and say, what can I do now? Well, we have, we have just analyzed the uh, Internally, all the drivers for these people who opted to skip and to those people who opted to, to, to stay there. And we knew, uh, we saw that being a YouTube user, so the more YouTube users you are, the more you skip because you are more familiar with the system and you tend to, to skip more. Uh, with the socio demographics, take, take into account that we are talking about mainstream ads, tested amount. Uh, uh, among mainstream people. So they are not targeted, they are not programmatic. But then we, we saw that 
the younger they are, the more likely are to skip, and uh, males tend to skip more than females. Maybe we need uh, something different, but I don't know. This is the, what we found. We, maybe with 10,000 more uh, cases, we will have something different. Also the brand. So if you are a very strong brand, uh, people tend to stay because they know you, they know what, which is your message. They have some closeness with you, some relationship, and it makes, you, makes them to want to stay with you till the end if the stories that you are telling them are interesting enough because they, they also appreciate the fact that the true view gives them the option to select what they are interested on. So the engaging thing is very important for them to keep uh, going with the ad. And of course, the creative. So the creative is important. They, if they like it, if they are entertained, etc., they keep. If not, they only just skip because they are just bored. So the media matters, but really the creative is very important. So it's not the media by itself. It's not because it just jumps before your content that people is there. It's because what, you are, what is jumping is really interesting for them. And uh, Google had analyzed um, thousands of, uh, of ads, 16 hundred thousand, something like this, a lot of ads with different categories in and different countries in order to identify some of the elements that may help people to continue after these five seconds. I just extracted some of the tips, but, but uh, you know, they are available. You can just visit the thing with Google and you will find them. So it's a kind of the relationship that uh, when we talk about advertising always happens is like, if you show the logo at the first, people just run out because they thought that it's the same boring thing. But if you are not catching the brand at the beginning, they will never know who is the advertiser. So it's a kind of a very bad situation where if you want to keep them, you need to entertain them. But if you want them to know that you are the advertiser, you need to do something at the beginning in order them to know you. And this is something which is, seems to be very common sense, but uh, we have, there, there is a data that reflects that this is real. That if you want to keep them, entertain them, give some fun, some suspense, some emotion, so give them something, it's really important not to bore them in order to keep them till the end. But especially at the five seconds, at the first five seconds is where the moment of through. So if you are, Providing them something which is interesting, they will stay. If not, they just will run out. And this is something that will, if the first thing is a smiling face, something which is, who is happy, the engagement is at the beginning, so you can start working with them. And this is not, it doesn't mean that in all the ads you, you do this. It's just that it tends to uh, work better that other style. So just a clue to make them entertain and to keep them. And just finishing, finishing, sorry, we also did a test where we see the emotions of the people while they were watching the ads. So uh, they were watching and we have a curve that shows which are the emotions that they were feeling while they were watching the ads. And then we also test this uh, ad and check how, how if they were more skippers or less skippers according with the emotions that they felt. So you can see that in the top, there is a ad that they stay longer than the, which are at the bottom. And there's a, re a relationship between engaging people and making them feel happy with the, with the fact that they finish watching the entire ad. So engaging, make them happy, smile them, all these things are helping to get this push in the brand funnel that we have seen that we can get just because people is uh, watching the ad till the end. So, mm -hmm. no se deja. Okay. 
Okay, so just to finalize, it's just a summary. There are options beyond the cookies. So if we cannot measure everything with cookies, we can think about all their options. There are options in the analogic life that can help us when the digital is not always possible to be measured in the digital way. The first seconds can change significantly what you are doing. In this YouTube environment, it seems to be better to be in a prepare for a desktop rather than a mobile. And this makes the advertisers to think how they build the ads, because they should very fit very well in a mobile. And of course, plan your ads in TV plus YouTube, because it is worth. You will get better results for your brand if you are combining both. And that's all. all right. Okay, so last speaker is going to be Rene Deschamps. I first met Rene also one year ago in the same congress I met Eva. So I think we were having wines and pinchos first time we met, <laughs> so it's good memories. So uh, Rene is really an entrepreneur and a digital person. I think he says, I was on the internet already in 80, 1996. 95. 95. 95. <laughs> so it's really one of the pros. Uh, has been also, he, he, he created in 2003. Uh, an analytics company, right? An analytics consultant, I think, was also a visionary on that. Now he's taking the role one year ago of director of analytics and data science at uh, Neo Gilby. And he says he likes cooking and Lego. He's married with Aurelie, who is also on the digital, so I guess your conversations are mainly right. digital. He's bringing Lego there <laughs> with two children, so it's a great pleasure to have Rene here with us. Big applause to him. Thank you, Manuel. So I hope I won't hit the wrong button. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to say, Eva, I, I really liked your presentation because everybody's looking to integrate the on and offline world. And that's something that you've demonstrated with TV and YouTube. And Bosco, well, we work together a lot. As you know, we, we, we integrate all the Google the ecosystem around double click at, at Neo Gilby. And this really helps in doing, in doing our job. No, I didn't push any button, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm not guilty. <laughs> okay. And uh, so, I'm not, I'm not going to present, you know, fabulous cases. I'm humbled to be here. I, I want to thank the organization for inviting me. I wanted to start with uh, an idea that I had last, last decade is digital analytics is like cooking. Is that... People concentrate on the kitchen. You know, if I buy an expensive kitchen, you know, I'll be able to do marvelous dishes. Yeah, but if you don't know how to fry an egg, how the f are you going to, you know, make marvelous dishes? But people concentrate on the kitchen, you know. What I always say is that, you know, if you take Ferran Adria and you give him a camping gas, I'm sure he can deliver a dish which is amazing. It's important is Farhan Adrià. It's not the kitchen. It's the analyst, the people that are going to work with it. And then you've got the recipes. Because very often, so the larger your company is, is the more chances are that if you lose your Ferran Adrià, you're going to have to start from zero. And the recipes are the processes. You need to document and have the processes in place. These are three key ingredients. And then, you know, when I was preparing this presentation, I thought, I thought it over and I said, oh, yeah, but let's go beyond, you know, because that's something I've used already. And I say, OK, then there's a mise en place, as we say in French. Uh, I come from Belgium. Uh, nobody's perfect. And so, but there are two types of mise en place. There's the internal mise en place of the kitchen. So if you're a digital analyst, uh, a data analyst, especially if you're a data scientist, you know how you have to prepare all the data before you even can get started to do anything. So that's a mise en place in the kitchen. But then you don't have to forget that you have the mise en place at the restaurant. 
before your clients come. The table needs to be, you know, ready. So when the dish comes out, you know, it's served. It doesn't get cold. Otherwise, you end up with this. Because in the end, that's a person that you want to have, you know, to cook for them. And we often forget about this. But I'll come to it. Okay, no. So, as I was saying in the, big, uh, in the beginning, it's about people. <coughs> people, people. And there are different types of people. So this is the Noma. I don't know if you know uh, a restaurant in Denmark, which was awarded number one uh, for a couple of years, I guess, uh, after Ferran Adria decided to close, to close his restaurant. But you see him, he is around people, and they're you know, preparing things. And you, know, you, need, you need a team. It's not done by one person. You know, the unicorn that you were talking about before, Bosco, that doesn't exist. So you need to build up a team, a set of mind capabilities. Then you've got your client. Your client can be internal or external, because you can be working in a, in a company or be a consultant for an external company. And you don't have to forget them. Because they are the ones paying your bills, they are the ones who are going to raise your, uh, your salary at the end of the, of the year, etc. I was, uh, I was given, okay, let me do a Kit Kat, you know, a little parenthesis. So I, I, I was teaching at the IE in Madrid uh, on the Big Data Master a few weeks ago, a, le a lecture about digital analytics, and somebody raised a hand and asked me, Rene, but how can I make you know, myself more, you know, more present, more open within the organization, and how can I scale up? So you need to speak business. And to give you an example, the Financial Times, I've got a friend of mine who started at the Financial Times just as head of analytics, and now he sits at the board. At the board, with the CEO, because they see data very valuable, because he was able to build a team and to address these people questions. And last but not least, when we talk about people, is that we're measuring people. You know, we talk about cookies, we talk about, you know, page views, etc. But in the end, it's like stadiums of people. And you cannot put them in the same bucket. I mean, if I go and I zoom in, I'm sure I'm gonna have somebody very happy, enthusiastic, somebody somebody hating, you know, the results, the score, somebody who's bored there because he's just joining his pal, something like that. So we're measuring people. We're not measuring machines. And we often forget when we're dealing with data. The challenge, one of the challenges, and I've seen this all over the place, is there's too much data. Yeah, but I don't know what data to give. It's easy, you know, to start digging in and playing with the data. As, as uh, Manuel said, so uh, I, I married Aurelie Pols, who's now working for a DMP, Crux. <laughs> and she started doing analytics in 99, digital analytics. And now that she's working in Crux, she says, I don't want to enter the tool. Don't give me access to the tool. What she wants, it's answers to her questions. She has business questions. She has no time to get into a uh, you know, the, the digital analytics tool and dive in, even though she has the capabilities. But her time is better consumed elsewhere. So we need to answer business questions. So here are three, three, uh, three examples of failures of my, uh, my agency in, in, in Belgium that I, that I sold to Digital LBI. First, we had a major telco company in, in, in Belgium. And the deal, we sold uh, uh, an analytics tool and the implementation, all the consulting, but to the wrong business owner. It was IT. And so IT didn't really give us a brief about what to do. And we were, well, they're paying us hours per month to do analysis. OK, let's, let's see where we start. And we started with a page, the section where the, they were selling um, uh, come on, mobile phones because we saw there was a big opportunity to optimize that section of the website. And so we went in, we did the analysis, we came with options, here's what you need to do to optimize. And then when that went up in the organization, 
they said, oh yeah, but we don't want to sell phones. That's why it sucks, because it's not in our, our, our interest. We don't have the margin, we don't have high margins, but we didn't have that information. So we need the context, we need to see the priorities and the margins. Second example, it's a big manufacturer of uh, electronics, you know, uh, between te television, head headphones, etc. And uh, we were managing their uh, e-commerce on a European level. They didn't want to tell us which products were more profitable for them. So how could we serve them? We need that information. And the last, it was the upwards, that the most strange analytics project I've had in my life. So imagine uh, an international uh, military uh, alliance. And they called us to measure the internet. So we went in. So we had a security clearance, you know, all the shit you can imagine. Yeah, we went through it. And military guys, very serious, after you, you pass all the security, etc. And they cannot show it to us. We were not allowed to see what was going to be measured. It was, okay, we have content A, content B, content C, and what we needed to do is all, you know, the, the instructions without knowing what the mm, was in there in order to set it up and for dummies. So that, that was awkward. I just want to share with you, you know, those are not, you know, high cases where oh, we, get, we got a lift of 50%. No, the, those are things that happened. And, and another example is lack of standards and documentation. And this is getting back to the recipes, to the processes. So for a government body of Belgium, I won't enter into details, they called us because they have 50 different applications. And you have to imagine, if I'm a government, the applications need to be used and you know, are, are at the service of the citizenship. Every tool was done by a different company. There were no standards, no documentation. A project that could have been done in six months took over three years. Because every time we, we tackle one new product, it was kind of, oh, that looks different. Oh, and how does it work? Can I have the documentation? Oh, no. So we had to bring in a programmer to investigate the code, to see exactly how it worked, to see where we needed to measure, you know, where to put the tags, etc. So very important. Keep documentation and start have standards. Also, th this is a real story, is avoid the temptations of, of the shiny new tools. Okay, sorry, Bosco, I, I love your tools, but you know, and this is not about Google. So I was uh, chairing a, a conference, uh, I think it was three, four years ago in Berlin, and I had the, the head of analytics of a major European airline, so that came to me and said, oh, Rene, Rene, I, I have to show you something. He came with his laptop, you know, you, you know, it was like a boy, you know, he, he wanted to show me the holy grail. There's a new feature in web trends, I have to show you. Okay, show me. So he gets in, and we see a map of the world, and then little white dots. And he said, yeah, this is all the transactions that are taken, you know, in real time. Okay. And he was looking at me, what? You, you, you don't find this, you know, impressive? And I said, what's the point? How do you activate this? So getting back to your presentation, Bosco, is, okay, that's very cool, that's very fancy, it will look very good at the reception of your company, but in fact, let's be honest, there's no way you can activate it. So it's useless. So please, don't be tempted by vendors. You know, they're going to show you things, and that's not the purpose. Okay, it had to happen to me too, so, but... Uh, as in the third, I guess that, yep. So getting back to business questions. Here I want to share a story about how to define KPIs based on a business question. This is a friend of mine who uh, works in, in the Nordics and had a customer of him in Finland that was a MTV3. So this is a, it's a major media company over there. And there was one question. They had lots of questions, but I'm just saying about one question, which was, how do I know when I have to change the content of my homepage? 
simple question, you would say. But that's a business question. But how the, you know, how am I going to do it? And he came out with two KPIs, front page bounce rate and a front page time index. So the percentage of bounce and how many seconds did people stay on the home page. And he mixed them. And if we go into details, you say, OK, both of them, you have to check them every hour. The benchmark for the home page bounce rate back then, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, uh, the, the bounce rates are higher, was 15%. And there's a red flag when there's a 20% um, deviation. So 20% means 18%, huh? not 35%. Okay? And what action, oh, who's the actor? Very important. Who's the, who's the guy who needs to see this KPI on an, early, on an early basis? It's the editors working on the page. Pretty simple. And very important when you define a KPI is what do I do as an action? You know, give them you know, what they can do. Here is see when, when you have the red flag, so you have a deviation. So let's imagine the, the bounce rate increases to 20 to 20%. What do you do? You check the second KPI, so the home page index. If it's comparable, so if, uh, if they're going you know, the, the same way, it's time to change the content. So, sorry, if it drops, I don't know. If it goes down, it's time to change the, uh, the content. That means that you know, people come and they, oh, I've seen that already. I'm gone. And the, the home, uh, home page time index means that they're not staying any longer. Is they're staying less and they're, and they're bouncing. So that means that you need to refresh your content. Or maybe tweak the content. If, if you don't see, if you see that the time that is spent on the home page is the same, what you need to do is tweak the content. Maybe the headlines. Maybe had something more compelling. Okay? When you see the home page time index, it's the same. Here the benchmark is 85 seconds. Deviation, again, 20%. And the action is, if it gets lower, you know, check the first KPI. If it's similar, then change the content. We've seen it. If it's higher and the first KPI is OK uh, <clears throat> or lower, you have a usability problem. People are not finding what they're looking for. And then what, do, what should the editor do? Give it to the analytics team to investigate further, because he has not the knowledge to investigate further. Okay. This is one business question, how it's resolved with two KPIs. And to close up, because I don't want to steal too much time, and, and, and I want the debate to go on, one thing that I love is monetizing user behavior. So this is an example from uh, uh, an e-commerce website. Um, I've put you uh, a link over there so you can see uh, the full presentation with all different, you know, for lead generation, for the other websites. But in the end, what, what I want you guys to, to, to take in mind is here. If you make an hypothesis that if I make this change on the website, I believe that I can increase from the 7.62% that I have now as conversion rate to let's make 8.75. Then you can start talking about money. That's how much money I can generate. But very often, when you're working in big companies, you have IT that says, yeah, but that's on the next batch. Yeah, the next, so on next quarter or even next year, we'll tackle this. And then what you do is that you measure how much money can I win and the impact of a three months delay. That's what I call reverse monetization. And when you, you, you bring that number on the table in front of business people and you tell them, I don't care, you're going to lose one, one million euros. All of a sudden, the IT guy is in trouble and he's going to change it. Okay, you have the presentation with, uh, with other examples uh, on the link that I provided you. And with that, thank you very much. So thank you, thank you, Rene. No offense to the IT teams, they are great. So yes, Sorry? I know some, some IT people are here, so they oh, are no, great. No, no. They, Don't take it they really rock, you know, especially <laughs> at the company I'm working for. 
Uh, so uh, time for the debate, so I will ask three of you come here. I will raise a couple of questions, and then they will open for you guys to raise for a question. Mm -hmm. OK, I'll go for the green. Future's green. <laughs> I ended up with the purple, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so first, guys, thank you for the three presentations. I think they were really fantastic and different points of view, but really complementary and providing good visibility. So. First question, uh, and I think uh, you both mentioned, you also mentioned through the race piece, is the people, the talent. I mean, it's an ongoing conversation about those companies really wanting to get into data-driven world. What are your recommendations in terms of bringing the right profiles? And don't say bring your companies, either Google, Neo, or Exodus. <laughs> what would be your recommendations with type of profiles or how to prioritize the creation of teams internally? If I, if I may start, very often what I see is that people want them all. You know, it's kind of, yeah, I'm going to hire you know, a full team of analysts, etc. when the organization is not ready. So I would say before you try to run, start by walking. So it's like uh, this morning I received a, a newsletter from Avinash. I don't know if you, you're subscribed. He was talking about attribution. And he was saying, are we going bananas? Everybody's talking about attribution here and there. And they don't know the basics. So you're going to give them attribution, which is kind of a, wow, something hyper advanced, which, by the way, I don't like the word. I prefer contribution, because it's a matter of a, you know, how different touch points have contributed to a goal. But let's walk before you run. So I, I agree also with Brené. I don't think there is one size fits all. So it depends on your business needs. Because depending on those business needs, you will, diff you will need different profiles. Whether uh, the, the fact that we use the unicorn figure to describe them is not casual. It's, it's not by chance. It's something that we meant to purpose. So we receive, uh, I would say, a number of calls quite high per day to actually uh, ask us for different profiles for different needs. And there are not those many guys out in the market that actually have these capabilities. So what we've seen is also an, a trend of trying to build those capabilities internally. And actually, you need a partner to do that. No? So you partner with someone that can guide you and your organization through that change with the ultimate scope to transfer that knowledge to build those capabilities uh, in your house. So that would be my view. Well. More or less, I, I think that it's like uh, the best is to have small small pieces of different things that can bring to a, together and build uh, a knowledge and, and, and exchange knowledge. So nothing is perfect. We know that. So bringing small pieces maybe it's better than just trying to find the big one that covers everything. And actually, the more heterogeneous is the team, the better, because you have really people who is very experienced or people who is very young and have another, you know, uh, way of seeing the things. So maybe this experience uh, versus uh, fresh air is something that it's, it helps a lot. Okay, thank you. My last question, and then be prepared for whoever is interested in asking questions. So. I think, Eva, you mentioned in your presentation is somehow implicit in everyone's is about the smartphone. So now it, it's like a hot topic. Anyone uh, doing marketing knows how difficult to track different devices. So what do you think? And, and also, I know Google has these micro moments and different moments. So what is your point of view on how should companies tackle smartphone? Because some companies say, hey, it's a different device, but at the end, it's the same customer. So curious to know your thoughts on your best practice on how to address the smartphone. It's like uh, uh, being able to see how is the future. So the point is that um, the logical thing is that we need to follow, follow people. And to follow people, the smartphone is the way. The point is how to balance it with their privacy and with their, uh, the likelihood to, to share with us. Because you know we are market research companies, so we are just asking them to share with us what they are doing or to share with us some of their moments. 
So it's a kind of balance of uh, intrusiveness and uh, sharing, uh, sharing things. But of course, it's, it's the future, and it's something that it's not only in Europe, it's all, ar all around the world, that the mobile is the future. So it's something that we need to think twice. But for me, the difficulty is how to balance both the pri privacy and the sharing thing. Well, for us, it is a crucial question. So, so basically, we, we need to have that single view of the, of the customer. And actually, how we're talking the problem, because we are, we are fortunate that we have some data at Google, and, and basically really? what, some data. <laughs> and what we use is the, is the Google uh, device graph to actually make these connections between this user, is this user in this mobile phone, and is this user in the laptop. Uh, how we do it is, is deterministic. And it's because we have, I think, five uh, products that have over one billion users. So that's the way we connect the dots, to have that, that view. From a marketing or, or, or IT perspective, as you've covered already the measurements, I would say that very often I find companies that say, oh, I want to build an app. Yeah, what for? No, what's the point of having an app? You know, uh, maybe your company is not ready. And start with a, you know, a good website that is responsive, and responsive in the good sense, in the sense that it changes because it's accessed through a mobile hour or through a tablet. And uh, you know, maybe afterwards you want an app. And from, from a marketing perspective, I would say that everything now, you know, we are the center as, as consumers. And companies should you know, treat us the same no matter what channel. And very often they fail in having that seamless experience. So mobile is key in order to push that seamless experience from desktop, mobile, but also I'm talking about the offline. Because very often, are there, you know, we create silos. We've been talking, you know, in analytics, we've been talking about silos for many years, you know, that we need to bring down silos to have, you know, a good measurement, etc. And in digital, we're creating silos again, saying, oh, that, uh, no, I have the mobile channel. Oh, I have the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the paid media channel. I have a, come on, they work together. So bring, it, bring them down. Cool, thank you. Questions for the audience? Say some. Where are the Mic microphones? I think this one. Oh my goodness. Um, is this thing on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you're talking about the mobile experience uh, and treating people the same, whether they're on a mobile or on the desktop or whatnot. And I'm just kind of curious about if there maybe is a challenge there, do we think that consumers really have the same intent? No, uh, no, it's, a, it's not that you give them the same, treatment. let me, uh, the same treatment. That you provide, okay, if I have a marketing campaign, my, my, my mobile, uh, you know, ad on YouTube cannot be, you know, 180 degrees away from what I'm doing on TV or what I'm doing. So it has to be coherent, seamless. So, and if you talk about uh, customer service, if you talk about interactions with your consumers, with your clients, you know, oh, I just tried to do it through, uh, through your mobile app, but it didn't work when you're calling the call center. I don't know, I don't know how the mobile app works. So we need to integrate things. I don't know if that answers your question. Hi, uh, my name is Adriana Freitas. Uh, my question could be like, you know, first the point on, on the unicorns. I think like it's important also like, you know, before you build uh, the team of unicorns, you know the questions you need the answers. Otherwise, they're going to be sitting here without no questions. <laughs> it's like, a, it's a important. Uh, we know we're all here talking about advertising. Even though the word didn't show up, it's like, you know, we want to sell something all the time. It's like, you know, and measure how we're selling. And, and uh, uh, nobody mentioned about like the ad blocks and like, you know, all the tools people are using and, and the impact they're having. I don't know if you could talk about that. Ad blocking. Okay. So, interest subject. Actually, 
is a question that I normally use now in, in my interviews when, when actually I, I interview people for Google, especially younger profiles. The truth is that actually uh, they exist and we can ask ourselves why they exist. I have my vision on that you know, and probably all of us have a vision on that. The, the interesting thing is when you ask these kind of profiles is, do you use ad blocking? Yes, I do. Why? Because basically advertising annoys me. You know, why? Because it's not relevant for me. It's not telling me something that is useful for me. So that's, that's the first mistake, you know, that, that we, whole industry, advertisers, media agencies, all of us have made. And as a consequence, we have ad blocking. So what is interesting is actually when you try to dig a little bit in, so basically, so what do you think it would be the consequences to actually having ad blockers? So nothing. Life is fantastic. I get the content. I have no, no shitty advertising. Uh, OK. And what about the publisher? What about the publisher? Well, they actually need to monetize this content that are offering for free. Uh, OK. So how do you see where the, go the world is going? Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe they, they, they do something to actually avoid the ad blockers. Uh, OK. <laughs> Think different. Think what kind of impact might have in the business. Uh, OK, now, now I understand where you're going. OK, so the key question here is you, what would you prefer to actually pay for your content or have advertising? The answer is absolutely the same in every single case. They are not willing to pay a single cent. So uh, I think. Uh, that's that's the way the industry will go, and we see uh, we see some of the, some publishers already making this kind of approach in different countries. So, from my point of view, personal point of view, is actually how I see it, blocking. You don't hire people that use blocking. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you're doing here in Google, if you don't. <laughs> so, two weeks ago, there was a discussion at the European Parliament of how some MPs started discussing whether to forbid, to, uh, whether to make illegal to have uh, websites that blocked visitors with ad blockers. Sorry? So there are some uh, websites that have made the impossible to access a website if you have an ad blocker. So, and there are now some discussions in order to forbid that. So it's kind of, uh, let, let, wait, wait a second. Yeah, you know, one thing are, you know, government websites. You know, they're for all. But if I'm a private company and I'm giving you something for free, let me at least take out back with advertising and getting back with the causes. The issue is that, let's be honest, we've been bombarding all over the place. You know, I, I'm sick and tired in LinkedIn to see, you know, adverts for female entrepreneurs. Yes, my name is Renee, but there's no second E. I'm a man. I'm not a woman. <laughs> so we do a very bad job, you know, very often in advertising. I don't will be what, what my boss says to me is that every morning I wake up and my aim is to do less advertising. We want to do precision marketing. And that if you've got that relevancy, that precision, you know, we have to, to stop bombarding. It's not like TV where, OK, that's the slot I have. You know, 60% of the population is going to watch my ad, whether they like it or not. Digital can be much more precise. And we have the tools to do it. Programmatic buying. You know, create audiences with a DMP. Getting back to DMPs, another question um, about what you were saying is that, very often when you go and you speak to a client about a DMP, they, they are confused. It's not that they don't know what to use it for. It's, they don't know what it is in the first place. It's kind of somebody has told me about a DMP, and, and all of a sudden, no, you're talking about the data lake. That's not a DMP. And, but well, I could rant. <laughs> I, I, I shut up. <laughs> More questions? Capital there. Hello, uh, I have a question for Yara. 
Thank you. I was really impressed by the research you've done. I mean, it was a big challenge, I can imagine. Irina, and can, uh, you, can you put it closer? Uh, yes, sorry. And uh, I was really impressed by the work you've done. Uh, you've shown us some results, like general results, uh, but maybe you can give some particular details uh, whether you found any differences, country differences, you know, or something that particularly, uh, you know, caught your attention. I mean, in, on the regional levels. Okay, actually, the fact is that more than country differences, the differences are more based on the creatives themselves. Uh, just take into account that we, the design we have is a test versus control, so people who were exposed versus people who were not exposed. So at the end, what we are measuring is if the ad is able to make people know more your brand than not having the ad. So if the ad is good, it, it is not something that is related to the country. What is related to the country is how we measure it, because you know we were to a Muslim countries where people cannot go into the house, or this kind of thing. So, how we gathered the information was the difference. But at at the end, uh, there was not that in some countries things were working very well and in other countries very bad. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I also remember one of the key findings uh, you mentioned on top level at your presentation is that basically it depended uh, per advertising. If you had already a, a, a connection, but I also remember this insight that if the brand, the advertiser was known because it had in the past like big creatives, like, like you know, uh, let's say engaging creatives, uh, the people were actually willing to spend more time with them. And it's related also with their blocking. If you do cool things, things that matter, actually the results, you can see them everywhere. Time for last two questions. We have them already there. Two. Um, hi, my is quite short one. Should we expect from Google soon uh, IP targeting product or no? Hybrid targeting, you mean mobile desktop? Uh, I mean, when we want to address our potential customers and we know our specific bar persona, but it's a quite niche product, so we need to tackle it in a more efficient way and use their addresses so we can advertise based on IP and w what is their location, not in clusters, if this makes sense. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Rene also uh, used a, a very significant content that we see more and more, which is precision uh, advertising, precision marketing. That's exactly what we need or we want uh, to do, is actually uh, use all the data, not all the, all the digital uh, signals that we have from a user, but take into account, for example, what's, what he has been exposed to a brand, to a product, to our shops, and uh, more and more we see a trend that also take into account the context. Context is important. Weather is important. TV, what's going on in TV is important. Where you're located, those kind of things uh, are all the different kind of, of inputs that we take into account to actually do precision marketing. Uh, regarding IP addresses, uh, be aware that uh, in some European countries it's forbidden. It's against the law. And uh, the new uh, GDPR, general, the new uh, regulation coming up, who was adopted last week by the uh, European Commission and Parliament, and will enter into effect in two years, forbids it. So find other ways. You've got DMPs. So to find lookalikes, to, to find, you know, to, to from an anonymous point of view, build audiences. And then, you know, you can have second party data, I believe more in the second party data than third party data. So if you engage with a, a, a complementary company, you know, that's not your competitor, but you address the same audience, and you make exchange of, of data, maybe there you can help, you know, finding lookalikes of the people of your niche without having to, uh, you know, 
go into privacy concerns that will maybe take you in the front page of a newspaper. That's why you are Belgian, right? Sorry? That's why you are Belgian. No, it's, a, it's my wife is specialized on privacy, so. <laughs> she, Good, she, so I think that guy with the yellow jacket was going to be the last question. Uh, hi. Uh, I've been reading lately about messaging being the, the next big thing in relation with customers. Uh, do you think that's hype or, or, or that's going to happen and why? <laughs> Personally, I have two kids. I'm swamped by all the WhatsApps from the moms of the other kids. So if I start getting advertising on WhatsApp, I'll uninstall it. But that's my personal opinion. <laughs> But yes, there are lots of companies that are using and I see new generations, people who are in my team that are millennials, that they say, oh, and this company has not, not a WhatsApp for customer service. <laughs> and I'm kind of, beg your pardon? You know? <laughs> so it's coming, I guess. I don't know. Uh, no. any, maybe any, any an opinion from Google? Because I think maybe oh, Google's not the data. <laughs> Since the, all this is being recorded, <laughs> I'm talking about my opinions, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, so, so my point uh, here is think, uh, think about yourself on what you do and how much time you spend messaging. So is it probably it's a lot, right? <laughs> yeah? Probably. Uh, so it actually... Uh, my point here is that the user is messaging, right? So we have a number of users, a large number of users that use, spend a lot of time messaging. My question for you as well is, how would you receive an advertising in that quite intimate uh, moment of your digital life? I don't know. So uh, the use is other, the interest is obvious. You also have context. You, you can actually figure out within your connections or what you're texting, what could be your interest be. My question in this case is, is it a little bit too intimate? I don't know. No, we have enough advertising. I mean, so let's make it, let's make it work, you know, before we start opening new doors. So what I believe is it's useful for customer service. For advertising, you know, if I'm texting and all of a sudden I've got a what? What I'm gonna get? A banner? I'm not, you know, I'm not used to it. So maybe for new generations it would be it would be normal, but okay, good. Thank you guys again. Big applause for you all. Thank you. Okay. So time for the beer. You know, it's okay. on the left. <laughs>